the December 2018 Alliance of Independent Authors Self-Publishing Salon with me, Joanna Penn and Orna Ross. Hi, Orna. Hi, Joanna. Hi, everyone. Hello, hello. Here we are again. Here we are again, indeed. And this is exciting because what we're talking about today is how to position yourself for success in 2019. Can you believe we are on the cusp of another year? It's kind of crazy. But it's awesome. completely crazy. I wrote 2018 in, in our notes. <laughs> 2018 just went. Just, just passed us by. Um, so we are going to get into that topic in a minute. But first of all, as ever, uh, Orna and I are writers first and we always like to talk about what's going on. So first of all, Orna, what's happening with the alliance that you want to update us on? Yeah, uh, well, we have been for this quarter working on the self-publishing 3.0 campaign, which I've been talking about um, from the author's point of view a lot up to now. So we, we're talking, uh, for those who are not aware of what I'm talking about, essentially we're talking about authors now having the ability to develop scalable and sustainable businesses for the first time. So authors are no longer, you know, as self-publishing authors, I think it took a while for the penny to drop that we're not really freelancer content providers as mm -hmm. in the traditional system but we're actually people who run digital creative and um, micro businesses and so we have been doing a lot of work with um, our members and in other ways around this in terms of going on the author track but now we're turning the attention around and we're having some conversations with uh, creative industry bodies and governments and we're picking uh, six key territories for six different reasons which I won't go into now but we'll be uh, filling our members in on all of this shortly. Australia, Canada, Ireland, uh, New Zealand, UK and US and making the argument to governments there that we're essentially part of a dark economy you know everybody's talking about falling author incomes in in arts councils and creative mm -hmm. industry bodies and that is terrible and that is happening but there is a very lively vibrant self-publishing sector that they are not recording at any level and so we want to make ourselves visible at a minimum but we also want to see some training going in some skills training for the kinds of publishing you know tasks that we face as authors and also mindset training uh, as well so that's mm. where we're turning there yeah I also think like there was some discussion in the uh, one of the groups about accountants and recommendations for things and I think there needs to be education in the financial bodies because that you know authors like us we're defined as authors but our income is actually more like internet entrepreneurs and so things like VAT which sales tax in different um, jurisdictions you know people accountants who are used to authors making royalties and paying agents are giving the wrong advice to authors who make their money online like we do through a third party site like Amazon or Kobo or whoever so the the, the education also needs to be in those different bodies do you think the same? Absolutely. And the point you make about creative entrepreneurship is really key because that's what we are. That's where we fall now. And that's not traditionally where authors would have located themselves. And that needs a mindset shift within these bodies, within the services that we hire, and but not least within authors ourselves. To, want to understand that actually takes quite a bit of a mental leap, and particularly because we're so focused on writing and working in the business, you know, that idea of stepping outside and having we work on the business as well as publishing books it's challenging it's doable because we've lots of members who are doing it but definitely authors need support and the kind of support that's being offered to authors is very much a handout mentality from governments you know it's about funding you for time so that you can write this book whereas we're saying no it should be invest in our skills and we can earn the money ourselves so it's sort of you know teach about fish and uh you know it's not just for, for a day it's not just giving you the fish or whatever the cliche <laughs> is <laughs> Bundled cliche, but you know yeah. what I mean. <laughs> That's awesome. So, um, and then we we like to just give you an update on our creative work because you know we are both managing our creative side and our our business side. Um, so for me this this month, I've been doing a lot of publishing tasks. Um, I'm getting my books into large print and hardback editions. And I've, I'm working, you know, obviously with Jane, wonderful designer, which is really helpful, but still the publishing tasks of uploading files and checking stuff, not kind of soul destroying for me. So I have started, even though I'm gonna have to have a break in the middle, I've started my um, next Matt Walker fantasy, started researching um, the Black Death, which is super exciting for someone like me. <laughs> 
<laughs> Destroy 30% right, of young people. Black death. <laughs> Black death. So um, having fun with that. But really, for, you know, you have to have that balance. Otherwise, you go nuts. Like, you, you, you might as well go back to your day job if you're kind of miserable in everything you're doing. So I'm trying to balance that really hard. Like, go do the creative, satisfy the creative, then do the, the business stuff. Um, also prepping a business plan for my uh, next, I'm actually going to start a new content marketing site for my fiction in 2019. But I am, instead of just jumping into it, I am actually doing like a business plan, which I didn't really do such a detailed thing before, but I feel like this has to be right. So I'm working on that. Um, it, it'll, I'll be launching it on the 10 years of my podcast episode in March 2019 so I've got you know a few months before that's gonna go out there um, which is kind of marketing but also something creative because I will be using my research process to uh, you know offer my photos to the world through various I haven't thought about the licensing yet but you know stuff like that which is another creative potential income stream around my fiction so really trying to future proof my next 10 years that's the thing I've also been getting into Amazon ads which we'll talk a bit about later so what about you Orna what's your your month been like yeah lots to talk about uh, again a shift for me um, around marketing and um, that was kind of ignited here on this salon I think it was two or three sessions ago where we were talking you were talking about pre-orders and it really kind of hit me and I have kind of come up with this new marketing new way of marketing and uh, promoting so I my idea was that, it, you know, the traditional launch is built around time. So the date is set, everybody builds to it, you get your six weeks or whatever, and all the activity goes in around that. And I, I don't think that makes a lot of sense for us as Indies. And we've discussed that lots over the time, you know, the way in which it is different for us. And we're kind of on a never ending tour. But I still think a first book deserves and needs that kind of push at the beginning. So I decided I'd do this experiment of pre-order marketing. So that when I hit a certain amount of pre-orders, then I'll launch the book. So I put it out there and um, on two completely different projects, one being the first uh, Go Create a Book, the second one being a poetry book. And uh, interesting, just it's literally just a couple of days old, but there has been reader objection, <laughs> which is, <laughs> is kind of interesting. Somebody wrote to me very long, considered a very interesting email. So I'm kind of taking taking on board the fact that, that she didn't like it. It's just one person, but we'll, we'll see. Also working on workbooks um, with Jane, I have this need of what you were talking about there, the balancing, uh, you know, the different sides of ourselves. I just had this need. I want to create something, create something nice something I haven't done the kind of hands-on print project since the big Yates project I did mm. a few years ago so um we went back and we're revamping to a free writing notebook and the starter pack that we did some time ago and I've two new I've uh, that I'm really happy with a quarterly planner for the go creative method which kind of brings everything in across a quarter across a week across a day across the next hour you can actually work out with this um you know what you're doing kind of thing in a very different way to your conventional planner thing so it's the kind of thing that will appeal to people like me and um, people who think like me and so I'm really enjoying that and infographics getting all into infographics as a way to just get things across really succinctly you know uh, the other thing that happened to me was I had my first experience of VR in oh, that, yeah writer's I game it. my mind completely blown I mean I could do a whole mm. show on it but it was just incredible and I was thinking about poetry online particularly because you know poetry is having its moment now but it's quite difficult online to get attention for the kind of poetry that I write which needs attention it's not you know light and, and easy to absorb necessarily well some of it is but some of it isn't for that kind of poem this immersive experience is just so mind-blowing but also I watched a few stories and uh, lots of different things on it and just can totally see the potential. So I found out that it's 30 grand roughly for 20 minutes. So I'm actually going to see if I can get some funding. I have a, an idea for a very short project that I would really like to do. So off on that little jag as well. Thank so yeah, busy well, month. Well, it's interesting. So that VR, if people didn't get your accent, some people don't, uh, virtual reality. Oh. <laughs> 
<laughs> and I think, I mean, I, I thought, I think for experiencing our fiction and also augmented reality, like I want to be in, you know, you can see me walk alongside you along South Bank of London while I tell you a story. Um, and also, I think you and I could be doing this in a VR world like High Fidelity. You know, people could actually join us in, in a, wherever we want to set it you know uh, and yeah. we would sit here talking we'd be in the space but it's great that you saw it because I saw it like four four years ago or something and it's come on such a long way but when you actually experience some VR you know thing you're like oh okay and you turn around and it's, it's just crazy so well you get it in a way I mean everybody was talking about VR and, and you were talking years ago to me about it and I always intrigued by the idea but the experience is so different and I didn't even know what augmented reality was and I realized I've been doing it for ages I go to um, a health uh, studio where we have actually virtual instruction and you know if you're doing your yoga you're on a mountain and there's smells wafting from the butterflies going up the wall and yeah, yeah. so that was what augmented reality was who knew <laughs> but I can really see the potential for writers and most of the people who are involved in virtual reality and augmented reality and games and all of that they don't know how to write and they are mm. hungry for scripts and now the new headset is going to be about 500 pounds or something the new one that's coming in the spring so I would say within a few years everybody is going to be sitting on their sofa with their headset on you know <laughs> yeah, four different people in four different worlds yeah I agree and it's so funny because I just looked back I wrote an article for the future book in 2015 about this and I said hey everyone let's create some kind of group where we can look at the future of publishing in VR and of course no one ever got back to me because I said it would happen in the next year and of course we're three four years on so who knows I mean I'm usually early on this stuff but um, you are early uh, it will happen though yeah, it totally will. I mean, it's so cool. Uh, okay, so let's get into the news and let, before we get into our thing. Now, we will kind of um, talk about this in more depth when we get into our, our sort of recommendations. But probably the biggest thing that's been talked about in every single Facebook group is Amazon kind of craziness that's been going on, um, you know, also bots disappearing. There was one moment and, and it affected me, uh, you know, almost all of my books seem to disappear from the Amazon store, amazon.com. And, you know, the established wisdom was to resubmit all your books. And I have a lot of books. So I spent, uh, you know, half a day resubmitting all my books. Oh, you're fine. That didn't work. And then, of course, we found out that was a bit of a glitch. But then also we found out about this new beta reporting, which does split the world into country specific stores, a bit like Apple. So there has been there's obviously changes going on in the back end of Amazon that they are not telling us about and we are just being affected by. Um, also, people are seeing changes in also bots. We're seeing, um, you know, ads questionably things whether they're working or not uh so but no one's told us anything so Orna you have a, a way in to Amazon in some sense uh so what what are your thoughts on all of this uh nobody's told us anything <laughs> 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 to be blunt I mean there's lots of lots of talking but no information really because I think this is much bigger than we were talking about this before uh, we came on air this is bigger than just um authors but it's affecting us um hugely now there are two things going on and it's until the dust settles a little bit and i know people in the office say but it's been going on for three months but three months is not a big uh, it's not a long time for the kind of shift and change that's happening here so at one level we've got glitches we've got lots and lots of problems and in a sense that that will be okay because uh, yeah they're horrible when they're happening and when it affects mm -hmm. your book and particularly if it affects a launch or something really important for you that's really horrible I'm not um, belittling that in any way but there is a sense that it may be a much bigger change in actual approach and you, you know Amazon has always been unique and the reason it has worked so very well for Indies is because it has always put the customer first. So it has given the customer whichever book they wanted um, at the best possible price and that's always been their way and they differ from that uh, in that way from other services that we like and approve of uh, Kobo and Apple and, and people like this who have uh, a different have different approaches that are more in line with the traditional approach and which you get in the bookstores which is put put the stuff out front that pays you to be put out front and the op-ed thing 
So there are indications that Amazon is moving into an advertising-led environment and that it uh, certainly don't know that, but certainly as authors, we need to think about that possibility and what that looks like. And mm. you and I were kind of speculating about that uh, before we came on and it is speculation at this stage I hasten to add it's not definitely policy and nobody has confirmed it or anything but there are indications and lots of there are lots of reasons to think it's not just idle speculation there are lots of reasons to think that this serious major shift is happening so yeah I mean maybe you'd outline a few of the things that it could mean for for indies mm. Well, I think uh, I've certainly, you know, looked at my own data and I'm wide. I also have multiple streams of income. So I, I don't sit on Amazon every day. I don't. I actually only look at my um, sales. I look at income and uh, money in my bank account like all the time because this is my business. But I don't look at sales figures of individual books until the year end usually. Um, but when this all cut was kicking off, I was like, OK, let's look at my sales figures just on Amazon.com and .co.uk. Uh, which is where I've seen the also bought change, uh, you know, for the last year and just see if there's any trends that you can see. And there's very clear trend from September-ish. Um, and some of my books even went to zero sales, as in they literally, th there are zero sales in so September. Selling. Yes, oh, so September, October, November, whereas before that they had kind of, you know, they ticked along, I do enough general marketing and these are fiction so I have none of all my non-fiction has carried on selling but my fiction very much because I don't do like active push push stuff generally um you know it's been quite variable so and this is a series that didn't have a release this year as well so um this is part of a anyway the good thing so there's two sides to this coin as such the bad side would be oh my goodness everything's gone wrong we now have to pay to play and uh, like we do at the other stores, which have merchandising, as you say. And the other side of the coin is to say, oh, now we know what we have to do in order to sell books. And I actually, the good news is we started doing Amazon ads on these particular books that haven't been selling much. And we are now selling books. Now, I know some people listening will be like, yeah, I've been doing Amazon ads for ages. But, the, but and we have been running some. But the point is, that it seems to have shifted the organic, it's the organic stuff that seems to have disappeared or lessened over yeah. time. Yeah, so, but, so but to me it's but, but like a positive, like the positive thing is you now have more control than anyone and if the, the scales are tipping to the people who will take this seriously, I guess. Yeah, I think uh, it, it's important to say that what you experienced is not a unique and uh, individual thing. It's uh, uh, It's been happening. September was a key month for a lot of people. A lot of people saw the same thing happening. And I think, you know, we have a, a unique moment at the start of this, you know, which we will have with VR when it gets going in a while. I hope I pronounce that well enough for people to hear it. <laughs> But, you know, which was if you're in at the beginning of something and there are certain conditions in place, you can be very lucky and you can make money easily. Um, but that is not becoming an author publisher. Becoming an author publisher is something different. It's about, you know, perfecting those seven different processes of publishing. So it's the editorial and the design, the making the book and the, pr the production and the distribution that puts the book out there. And it's also the marketing and promotion of the book. And this is the aspect that a lot of authors struggle with. And Amazon, in a sense, has allowed us to not really have to think too much about that in within their ecosystem. If they are now changing um, the model and if it is going to be an advertising led platform then we need to rethink a lot of that and i i think it just emphasizes public self-publishing is not an easy choice it's a very empowered choice it's a very um creative choice it can be commercially very rewarding but it takes time to build always if you're doing it and a huge number of our members didn't hit the um amazon you know, the Kindle gold rush at the beginning and aren't um, Amazon only and never have been and aren't in KU for various reasons. Um, and, you know, so have never really experienced that. Lots of them have 
just done the slow, steady build year on year thing. And, and the people who have done that are less affected by these changes, obviously, than those who have put all their publishing eggs in one basket. Okay. Mm, but also, I'd add again on the positive side, I've heard from children's authors like Karen Inglis, who's been talking, you know, is on my podcast, Mark Dawson's podcast, talking about her success based on Amazon ads because she can finally target people who are buying popular children's books. And also, I've heard from literary fiction authors, um, can't name names, they haven't done it said it publicly but who've said that they are selling books with Amazon ads and they never really sold books before so it's very well I think we see this as ever you and I are both well I'm very glass half full I mean I, <laughs> I was like yay and I feel like this is almost a call to a call to arms a call to action um you know a sort of okay and I feel because I've probably no, I definitely have taken some things for granted and you can't another thing you know I, I my business is 10 years old now I can't just rest on what used to work we have to keep learning more we have to keep renewing our skills renewing everything and that's exciting because we love to learn right creative people love to learn yeah I think it is exciting I think we also need to recognize that it can be overwhelming and mm. particularly at the beginning when there's an awful lot to learn all it feels like all at once you know and that first effort of getting a book up there out there and just out of the world at all is in itself I mean just writing a book is a huge huge endeavor <laughs> never mind all the rest of it you know so the, that first time of just putting getting your book together getting it out there in any way shape or form Amazon was fantastic in that but look I'm already talking past tense it's still <laughs> happening <laughs> in the sense that some people could put it out there but it very much depended on genre and, and so on and you couldn't count on it and this is the point I think and, and this is the point that we we need to grasp as self-publishers we're in business and business is never easy and creative business is even more challenging than your average you know well-established business because it's always about change things are always changing but there are certain key and core principles that always apply and if you stay with those if you actually stay with it and if you're patient for long enough but you do need to realize that when you're going into self-publishing you are going into a business and you are going to have to invest time and money and you do need to look at your ROTI your return on your time investment and your ROMI your return on your money investment in order for it to to make sense and and what this does i think is it forces us back into being more business-like and this feeds into what i was saying earlier on about a lot of us need some help here we actually need some skills training you're quite a business-like person you have a business background a lot of authors come into self-publishing because frankly they couldn't get a publisher and they would have preferred to somebody some mythical angel who would come along and take their books and put them out in the world and you know get them a big audience but that it doesn't happen for most authors that way and so they come into self-publishing and they don't realize that in doing that they've come into business and they don't understand what it is to be in business the wonderful thing though about creative micro businesses it's not business as usual it is different and it is definitely if you can write a book if you can write a good book you can crack this stuff no problem you just have to give it the time and you also have to think about investing some money because nobody starts a business outside of authorship expecting not to spend any money mm. Authors, i think the only people who go into business thinking they can be in business without having to spend any money they'll get their friend to do the design and they'll get their high school teacher to do their editing and so on and it doesn't work like that and they make those time expensive mistakes and waste a lot of time and then come around to understanding what it is to be uh, an actual professional publisher so mm. that is the challenge yeah and the fun challenge I would say <laughs> yeah well, we, we love it and and lots of authors love it yeah, I'm, I'm just speaking to those who might be feeling at the moment, I can't do this. I'm just saying, look, you can, you just need to give it some time and then you too will have fun with it. Indeed. And of course, the Alliance has has uh, podcast episodes for people at different levels of their author career. And this uh, this is the advanced salon. So if sometimes if you're listening to this and you're not feeling like you're advanced yet, well, we're going to carry on talking about this stuff. So you can always tune in again. Um, OK, so we're going to skip on, I think, to our main topic. Is that OK? Sure. 
Yeah, okay, so we are going to talk about positioning yourself for success in 2019. So I wanted to start by saying uh, the number one thing that I've been thinking again is focus on independence. Now that might not be like a headline <laughs> because that's what we're talking about generally, but I think this stuff with Amazon, the um, just in general, the kind of the changes that we're seeing in different markets, this shouldn't be a surprise. It happened with Facebook. Um, you know, we're all dependent on these different platforms. In fact, even in the last week, Jeff Bezos spoke at a private gathering that somehow CNBC got hold of and said, Amazon will go bankrupt. Amazon may only last 30 odd years. Now, I fully intend to be doing this for more than 30 years. So the example here is, build up your audience on other platforms and also look at um, direct sales, particularly with third party services that deal in EU tax issues, because it's not just EU anymore. What we're seeing is um, sales tax on digital is only going to get bigger. So um, I've been with uh, one particular company and I'm going to be moving into Payhip next year. So I've been doing direct sales since 20 well since 2008 um but i'm kind of again looking at a different tools to to spread um to spread that uh what else orna should we be focusing on in terms of independence well i think it first of all is to focus on the fact that you value independence of what it actually means to be independent and if all your publishing eggs are in one basket you're not and so also looking at the fact that books can be hard especially when you're starting out and learning to write well is something that you know for most just isn't something that happens overnight so you may well want to think about other forms of income. And traditionally, that's been kind of do a day job while I do my writing on the side. But because of the digital revolution, you can actually incorporate other ways of earning money into, into your author business. And um, we see people who are doing that really quite successfully. And there are, um, there are kind of seven roughly models that you can use. Uh, you know, to, to amplify your, your book um, or augment your book income. And just having a chat with this, um, about this, with um, one of our members, Jessica Bell, who some of you will know, and she was talking about she is now what she calls herself a multipreneur. So it's not just her books, it's also her, she sings and, mm. and she does um, design and she runs a literary magazine. And mm. so some of that is, yes, writing related, but there are also parts of her income streams now that have nothing to do with writing at all, but it's all there. Part for presence and one thing feeds another and so highly creative and so yeah think about that think about ways in which you can actually make money um, using your website think of your web website and this is the one thing I think there are no rules in this game but th this is a rule if there is one and that is have your own website and make it a functioning e-commerce website where you can sell directly and build that up mm. over time mm. Yeah, that's certainly as I, you know, I've built uh, my business, the nonfiction site with the creative pen through these various methods and 2019, I want to start doing that for, for fiction. So it's going to be a really interesting year, you know, I feel for my investigation into independence with the fiction side. It's, I think it's much easier to do with nonfiction, but I see, you know, the, the multiple streams of income around fiction is a, you know, it, obviously teaching is a big one speaking, but that I think there's other interesting models. That I think so too and I think this is again part of the measure of the confidence of the community I think when we were starting out you know we would think okay well I'm not going to make money with my fiction or my poetry so I better do something else mm. that will you know but if you look back maybe and I'm not saying this is you but um some people who have done that you know would look back and say if only I had put all my time and attention into other ways of you know building my income around my fiction or my poetry or whatever I mean I've spoken here on the show before about what a revelation poetry has been to me this year I just assumed you know just assumed no money in poetry because there wasn't in traditional publishing and how wrong that was so um, I think you know as the community grows in confidence and as we learn the business skills and what it takes and so on you can t you can now take all you've learned with your nonfiction, apply it to fiction and I know you'll be sharing that journey with us all next year as you always do so generously so looking forward to to all of that because I think it's easier than we maybe think it is I hope yeah I, I agree uh, okay so then uh, what we wanted the second point is 
back to basics uh you know sometimes we focus so much on the little like technical things do this click this button that we forget to kind of take a step back and take a step up and look at the kind of more strategic questions of positioning yourself and really thinking about what that means so um orna what do you think this sort of positioning yourself in the market uh, means for people I think this is super important to do this every year, you know, so that that's the thing that I, I would encourage everybody to kind of take this inventory at the end of the year, because things are always changing and they always will be in this business that we're in. And also we change and develop with every project we do and every book we do, even if we're, you know, it's not progressing for us, we are changing, learning more. And I think the more we bring a sort of an next exploratory and experimental attitude to everything we're doing the better and keep revisiting you know who are you is the kind of question that we need to ask ourselves as authors every now and again what are we trying to achieve here you know what do I want you as an author you're trying to have influence you're trying to have an impact you're trying to affect a change trying to entertain and uh, inspire educate whichever you need to kind of think, revisit um, at least once a year where you're coming from there. Because once you get it, it doesn't mean that you're there forever, but it does mean you have to be clear about where you are right now so that you can actually be clear in talking to your reader and, and put a coherent uh, message across to them. So I think that's really important to, you know, a lot of us, we're more than one person. You may be in more than one. Once you get who you are and what you're trying to do, that gives you your micro niche, that gives you your categories, that gives you your keywords. Everything becomes clear once you know that. But if you don't know that, if you're kind of floundering around that area, you can be wasting a lot of time. Mm, and also, I just wrote down uh, the not to do list. I've been struggling with this for, for a number of years, and you know this. I said probably three years ago, I need to stop doing so much speaking because it takes so much out of me. And finally, so 2019, I've turned down every single speaking thing, including one with you, which I... I know, <laughs> I've got it. She's really serious. <laughs> I, I, but it's really interesting because I've really come up against my ego because my ego says um, I want people to like me I want people to think I'm important enough to be a speaker and then I've come up against oh but it's good marketing you know it might not be fantastic income for speaking to groups of authors but it's like it's really good for marketing for my brand and I've sort of come up against a lot of mindset stuff and then I'm like well seriously if you want to start a new brand a new website a new podcast where's the time coming from and where are you well what do you have to say you don't do in order to say you do like we had this discussion around script writing again I just you know I want to do script writing but I don't have the bandwidth we have to think how uh, you know kind of that not to do and we, I might do it again another year it's just I can't do it at this point so really interesting to keep revisiting and again people don't look at Orna and I and think that we've got it all sorted out like we're permanently reinventing what the hell we're doing but what we are doing I think is consistently producing consistently creating and consistently doing business stuff um because yeah we we, we enjoy it but also we have to <laughs> we have to it's it's our it's our lives and our livelihood so there mm. is no choice and often with these things there may be something that you realize you should be doing um as an author that you're not getting around to and i find something that's really useful is to kind of lock myself in to create a scenario where i have to do it and you know um mm um that that can be useful but everything as you said everything you're choosing to do has a corresponding not to do and everything you choose not to do has a corresponding you know will give you more time and going core and staying core just in that moment and realizing it is a long life and it will be a long career because we can now do it's not like before where you got one book and a big rush and then it was all over maybe you are step by step, asset by asset, book by book, building slowly over time. You can count on that. You can relax and do whatever you're doing now fully and leave some of the other things that you'd love to do for a little bit later. Mm, absolutely. OK, so then um, the next thing we've kind of put under become a better publisher. And I was thinking about this because I know a lot of traditionally published authors and the kind of the common thing is, oh, publisher X has not been doing this properly. Publishers, my publisher doesn't hasn't done this. And it got me thinking. How much should we complain about ourselves as a publisher? So you so think of yourself. So 
is you, the author, happy with the way you, the publisher, is actually treating your IP? And it made me think, ooh, ooh, that's a tough one. Like, I should be moaning about why my publisher has not got my whole backlist into audio, for example. Or, you know, and again, that's financial, depending on where you are in your career. But for me, it's like, why don't I have hardbacks? Like, why? seriously, why do I not have hardback books? And, um, you know, again, why am I not taking my Amazon? What, why am I not selling more books? Why is this book gone to zero? These are the questions that you... It's that it, that two head approach, you know, keep the writing in the creative head in the creative space, forget all of this. But then when you look at your your business becoming a better publisher, are you doing the best for your intellectual property assets? And I've had to answer, no, there's some things I could do better. So what about what about you, Orna? Oh, hugely rubbish publisher. <laughs> I am, you know, I am. If 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 we're on a scale of ten, I am about three in my own <laughs> estimation. I really want to get so much better at public. I mean, I do okay, you know, but I could do so much better. And give us um, some specifics. Yeah. Well, um, I I think you've already talked about different formats would be one thing. So audio, I have half done audio lots, but I've never actually gone all the way and, and got some books out into audio and up and selling. That will be one thing. Um, I am in the process now of doing the hardback and the large print because they're relatively easy wins, I think. Mm. But also just being much more, because I've been over four different genres, which is not, you know, um, in certainly makes for a longer lead in. So I, I kind of have to go a little bit easy on myself because it took me a long time to work out what I was doing in each of those and, mm -hmm. and to realize they actually needed very different approaches. So you don't market and sell poetry in the same way that you market and sell a nonfiction book. I mean, it sounds so obvious, but you know, as a publisher, you kind of had your tasks and you did your thing and you kind of patted yourself on your back, on the back if you managed to get them done. So this is what I'm talking about revisiting and going back there. For me this year, I think I really took a step forward as a publisher that will become visible next year which is in understanding the different ways in which the different uh, genre need to be approached but also that holding myself accountable as a publisher you know realizing that it's not good enough to just kind of get the book together and put it out there mm. thinking more strategically about the launch ideas of that that was where the pre-order launch um marketing campaign idea came from you know questioning everything that I've been handed because I was part of that traditional system for many years so I carry a whole load of of stuff that I don't even know I carry so questioning everything yeah, all that kind of stuff. Um, I think I'd be a much better publisher. I might get to five in 2018. <laughs> well, and, and obviously these tasks, like when I was like, oh, I, I should do hardbacks. And they're great. And by the way, people listening, uh, Ingram Spark for hardbacks, print on demand. And of course, Ingram Spark for any print. But you can actually also do normal print and large print on KDP print. There's a, like a button for large print. So I do it on both services um and we'll put some links in the show notes about about that i'm sure <laughs> whoever's doing the yes show <laughs> we have a specific question here on a reference for the large print book so could you actually give your do you have it off the top of your head uh, well i i mean i have one on the creative pen doc, you know yeah. if you google the creative pen large print i've got a whole thing on it so you can have a look at that um but it's uh i can't remember what it was oh yeah i was gonna say you said okay i'm questioning you already you said obviously you can't say market poetry in the same way but ad, amazon ads for poetry totally can i mean it is actually as you you know you would be putting your poetry book on those insta poets and the other thing i was going to say around print is 2019 we could be this could be the year that things really shift i mean we're seeing in quotation marks death of the high street in britain we're seeing the shift online i think 2019 i'm willing to kind of but, oh, I'm always early, but I think indies are going to take print market share for online sales from traditional publishing. So I think, I think it's happening. Yeah. I think it started. I think we're going to started. see this definitely um, growing without a yeah. doubt. Because so, yeah, don't be afraid. Like, don't listen to the, oh, hardbacks don't sell, oh, large print don't sell. Actually, these things are awesome. And now I'm getting, you know, people asking for them. Librarians want them. You know, this, this is stuff we can do. <laughs> definitely and we always said be in as many formats as you can 
on as many outlets as you can and that that guiding principle still holds true acknowledging that you know mm. as many as you can at first might be one and then it's two and then it's three you know so you you keep on spreading the circle out and certain things get easier as you go but there are far more formats than we ever thought about and I think one of the things that I find interesting in myself is I resist all that abundance I kind of I'm yeah I find myself I have to make myself that, okay it's okay to have five or six versions of this book and you know it's very little extra effort for me and if if you know let's see what it does but I, and my automatic thing is to kind of keep it more tight for some reason and again I, that's probably because of being so used to working in the scarcity model of mm. traditional media you know where everything is goes into a funnel and gets smaller and smaller it's kind of hard to turn that funnel around and go bigger and bigger and bigger and take in more and more and more but anything that's an easy win just do it just do it don't yeah. think about it just do it well, I, I mean, obviously, there's some formatting things around large print hardback. And there is a question here about timing, which I think we should do, um, saying, is it true that hardback should be released before paperback and ebook? And, and the answer is no, because that's a traditional publishing model. That I'm putting hardbacks on books I wrote years ago. I'm taking the time to update my back matter. But the point, the point is there is no time pressure almost I mean and I can put an ad now on a large print edition of a book I wrote five years ago and it will start selling because of because of that it will be found like I'm discovering with Ingram Spark the FEMA text the FEMA yeah. uh, choices so I, I'm going back into older books and adding more metadata so there's no time issue with the way we do stuff if you had a 10 year old book you could do an audio book now um, you know the you can do all of these whenever you want the thing to be guided by is your own profit, commercial mm. and creative profit. So traditional publishers do it that way because they make far more profit on a hardback than they do on an ebook. So they will really delay sometimes the ebook launch, even though um, readers are craving, you know, and jumping up and down and demanding the ebook, they won't release it. So, you know, they do it for profit reasons. But if you use profit as your guiding principle here, you know, and put a money sign beside something that makes financial sense that can actually help you to make the decision. Oh, okay. That's the one I'll do because there can be so many different options, but be guided. What is most profitable for you, for your yes. business? Yeah. Yeah. And I have some money to invest in doing the, you know, my backlist. And then um, just for, for some other, if you publish those books, like you just go to your Amazon author central and you ask them to link that ISBN with your other um, format. So if you have a look at, for example, My Valley of Dry Bones by JF Penn, you're going to see all of the formats. And in fact, end of days now, because that also has the audio book. So, and what's so amazing is only the biggest traditionally published authors have hardback, paperback, large print, audio editions, ebook, and the price comparison is incredible. So you might have a $25.99 hardback and then it will say you'll save $20 if you buy the Kindle. So I think there's lots of reasons why we want to be looking at all these different things. But as Orna says, you know, this is the advanced salon. So, we, you know, you don't do this with book one, day one. So uh, work up to it. <laughs> yes. And having said that, we have a question here about the most affordable way to create the audiobook, And that is actually a question to go to the beginner salon for any of those kind of maker questions. And we have a recommendation here for Findaway Voices, which is an ally partner member. And I know Joe loves them as well. They're, they are a good I do. recommendation. Yeah. Yeah. And let's talk about audio because I did have some really good chats with Findaway when I was at NINC um, earlier this year, Novelist Inc. Uh, in Florida. And I think this is another one of the predictions for 2019. And you talked about Digital Book World, um, this voice first movement so and when I came back from Florida I said to Jonathan my husband everyone's got these Apple watches and everyone's speaking and doing stuff with their voice with their watch and it's crazy and they're listening to audiobooks they're talking like it, and then they're using Google on their or not Google Siri on the watch and then all this stuff came up out about the um, voice ho you know devices in home the Alexa Amazon Echo the Alexa and now Alexa's going into all these different things and then of course the Google HomePod and the Apple like there's loads of now 
devices. And then I spoke to a couple of people who said they are encouraging their children to interact with the um, home speaker because they want to limit screen time for the kids. So the kids can say, um, you know, Alexa, read me a, the story. And they will prefer that to the kids sitting on an iPad. And all of these things together, I'm like, whoa, this voice first thing is going to be huge. And so what we need to start thinking about, and I'll be um, talking about this more next year, is SEO for voice. So when you ask a, a device a question, you often will use different language than when you type a question. It's fascinating. So, and I think podcasting is going to be the key because when we talk, we're using natural language and natural language processing is what's going to be used for this voice search. So I think this is a fascinating interaction between content production, value for a customer and being found in different ways, which is why I'm starting another podcast to try and get my fiction out there because it might be a, a sort of gateway drug into my audio so there's a few points on audio first but you were at digital book world which had a lot of that what any thoughts on that honor yes and um, bradley metrick who runs digital book world his whole gimmick is um voice first and he was very persuasive and it, again it was very interesting and we had the amazon alexa guy actually came and did a hands-on workshop so i actually again I have to do it to get it. I can't I can't get excited about this tech stuff reading about it, but having the experience was was really illuminating. And you know, anybody who's not in audio as yet, I really would encourage you to think about ways that you can use audio. And you know, I hear a lot of people saying, Oh, I can't, my you know, it's my accent, my voice, my this, my that, my it's it really is superly um you can get training on this and skills training on this you you're getting some aren't you you're doing yes, a course actually, around yeah. voice yeah and yeah. um, it's not set in stone you know we can get better at all of this and you know voice and performance is something that authors can actually improve on hugely and i've seen some members really transform people who are extremely nervous and not good and uh, voice wise learned how to slow down how to how to do it well so if you can find a place for alternative kinds of content as to supplement your text so obviously we write books we love books we're book lovers and always will be but do recognize that audio is just going up and up and up and a huge number of people will not read you but they would listen and think about what that means for you um, and even before we get into the voice seo stuff which you know i think is a whole other thing all in itself yeah yeah it's it's crazy i mean and this i think you know we're coming to the end mm. uh, of our time uh, this evening uh, or wherever you are in the world at this time but it, it feels like to me like we were saying before the call it, earlier in the year maybe six months ago it felt like oh everything's stabilized you know how to do things. We've got an established model. I think we even said this in one of these we sessions. Did. We, yeah, June, we were like, May, we did. Yeah, we were like, wow, it's like everything's stable. We know what we have to do. And then what we've seen, like coming to the end of the year, I, I almost feel that 2019 is going to be a really massive year. I think we've realized like some of these changes are happening and 2019 could be a really big shift. And I know sometimes I'm a bit, you know excited ball about these things but all this stuff coming together feels like yeah it feels like a big year to me it's 2019 yeah. and that is exciting i think um into yes sometimes it gets overwhelming but also like Anna said we are able because we're indie we own our rights we can move and we can kind of surf that wave and try not to get overwhelmed by it and and to, you know learn from each other enjoy the ride uh so that's that's kind of my my view for 2019 Absolutely. And I agree. I think 2018, all these subterranean changes that have happened, we're going to see them manifest in 2019. But I think once we stick to core principles, core good writing principles, core good publishing principles, core good business principles, and I know it's words that a lot of you are allergic to. I used to be allergic to it myself. If I can change, <laughs> you can change. Um, 
you know, these core things that don't change, that we're the same always and always will be, no matter what's going on at the level of technology and so on. There are core principles that don't change. And the closer you can you can be to those and, and stay with them, the safer you'll be. And, and also the final thing to say, I think, is to be comfortable with discomfort. You know, being mm. creative means you will be um, sticking your neck out, you will be experimenting, you will be exploring, you'll be doing daft things, you'll be doing things that won't work. Um, but, it, you know, that's all part of it. And you will feel sometimes, oh, God, why didn't I just go into a nine to five? You know, <laughs> you definitely will. But that's OK. Um, yeah. You will feel uncomfortable. And it's if you can reshape your kind of anxiety, if it stops you doing things, you can kind of think of it as actually this is this is creative anxiety. This is how I feel when I'm doing something that's really important and really different and that's growing me and making me a better writer, a better publisher and so on. Um, the people who do well are the people who have learned to kind of tolerate that discomfort and in a sense use it as adrenaline and use it as fuel. Mm. Fantastic. Right. So we are skipping December because everyone's busy. So we're going to be back in uh, for January. We or I guess February, February, or It'll whatever. Be our February show at the end of January. Yes. So we'll be recording that and we will hopefully have some more, like app updates on what's going on and exciting things. So um, I guess happy writing, happy publishing, happy Christmas, holidays, New Year. <laughs> and happy business. <laughs>